Ready. Hello, welcome to my new, uh, YouTube channel. My name is Atoma Eji. I'm very excited to be here with uh, Christian Ray Flores, who uh, I'm learning more about. He has a very, very interesting life story, and I just love his passion for the ministry. So we're going to get a chance to learn more about him today. Uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself, kind of share about a um, little bit about yourself, your history, and uh, perhaps some of the miracles that uh, happened in the early days of the Moscow Church. Well, that's a broad question. Okay, let me try to make it short. Uh, <laughs> I... Um... I guess you're probably asking in regards to sort of the backstory that is sort of strange. And, you know, the backstory is that I was born in Russia and then I grew up in Russia, Latin America, Germany, Africa, back to Russia, Ukraine, then United States, Philadelphia, Palm Beach, Los Angeles, Austin. That's, wow. the, that's the trajectory. You know, so four, four continents, six countries. And I think in that time, I think I had uh, listened somewhere that by the time you were eight, you had uh, learned four languages. Yes, yes. So I was sort of forced uh, by circumstances, life, right? That, um, you know, I, have to, I had to uh, learn four languages. Well, to be fair, probably by, by age nine would be a little bit more accurate, but yes. Yeah. Okay. So Rus Russian, Spanish, Portuguese, and English. English is my fourth language. Okay. So then I think I had, uh, your, your father is from is Chile. Chile, Chile, and then your mom is from Russia. Correct, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I know you were a pop star in Russia for a number of years. Can you share about that a little bit? Yes, I had a recording career for about a decade in Russia from the early to mid-90s to the early 2000s. So 93 to 03, roughly, you know. Um, that's where I was more, more active. Um, and... Um, yeah, I was just very fortunate, very lucky to be able to uh, be good at something, be good at music and show business, and uh, for that to be recognized and and people were paying attention to it. So I was, uh, I started my career in '93. By '90, by the end of '93, I was already on national television, and you know, so I ended up doing sort of the whole f show, full show business experience. You know, several albums, music videos, TV, radio live performances, you know, in front of thousands, you know, video, obviously TVs, millions of people and, you know, several million albums sold. Uh, so I had a, a very significant um, opportunity there just for influence in okay. the former Soviet Union. So it's all of the countries of the former Soviet Union, about what, 280, 300 million people in that, in that media territory. Yeah. Right. I think I had uh, listened somewhere that you were like, you had a number one hit. So at mm -hmm. the time you had, you know, really reached a huge apex in your career, but at the same time, you know, your life was kind of tanking. And I think that's kind of like when you became a disciple. Can you share about uh, that story a little bit? I was a Christian. I was a, yeah, I was, I had the number one hit at the moment when I was invited to attend the church. And um, it was sort of unusual, an unusual story from, in the sense that usually celebrities become Christians when they hit hard times. I was, I was actually professionally peaking, but personally tanking. So, uh, so I actually had the number one hit in essentially, I think, the month that I was baptized. So, um, so that's unusual. But uh, yeah, I was very miserable, I would say. If if there was if the diagnosis was available at the time, I don't. I, we didn't do these kind of things. I think I was probably clinically depressed at the time, uh, so just very, um, very very unhappy. And um, I think it was just I couldn't handle. The, there was layers to it. There's this old dysfunction, and then there's new dysfunction that comes out of being adored by millions of people and you know being recognized everywhere. I think it's fairly well documented that fame doesn't necessarily uh, promote good emotional health. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, I yeah. hear you. I, I definitely admire your humility. I listened to a few of your sermons, and I think you know to go from you know where you were, but then to also have self introspection um, and and just keep going and and just having that humility, I think, is definitely inspirational. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask was just in reference to some of the miracles that you witnessed in the early days of the Moscow church. Can you share about that a little bit? 
Yes, I, the Moscow church was started by a mission team. I, th- I believe it was 17 people or something along, around that number um, from all over the world, uh, many of them Americans, but not only. And um, it was, um, they landed in, the, in, in Russia right before the fall of the Soviet Union, which is a very interesting time to, to be there. So, and they, st- you know, by the grace of God and by the power of God and also the climate that was dominant at the time, they, it coincided with a particular time of hunger for spiritual, you know, awareness, I guess, in, in, the, in Russia. So they planted several churches. By the time I became a Christian, there were already maybe eight to 9,000 Christians. And that was in the fourth year, I think? In the, yeah, it was in the fourth year, so it was 95. Um, so they were probably approaching 10,000 or, or close to it. Um, so there was, it was re- tremendous growth very quickly um, with all kinds of challenges that go with it. But, um, <laughs> but I was there on the front line and, you know, I was able to, two years into my, my life as a Christian, I started, really wanted to do ministry. So I started phasing out the uh, showbiz life and going investing in ministry. So I started um, leading a, a group called the AMS at the time they had AMS groups all over, mm-hmm. uh, arts media, it was short for arts, media, sports. And we went, I believe we went from around 60 people to at the peak around 400 in, in, in the AMS in Moscow. And so that was really fascinating to be part of that and, and see God work. That's awesome. So I'm going to pivot a little bit. I know uh, just with your history, I know you're an entrepreneur, which we'll talk about a little bit later as we go on. But it seems like your great grandfather was also an entrepreneur uh, in in his time in Russia. Uh, I know right now, as a country, the United States is going through some, at least very visible gyrations. You know, um, as far as race and uh, racism and just culture issues. Now, these are definitely systemic. These aren't just one-off. I think these are systemic issues, which is really just sin. It's just another way of saying societal sin. Correct. Um, but I wanted to look at it from a different angle, which is, you know, maybe you can share about some of your history and just how you perhaps saw societal sin in Russia uh, with some of the things that happened, you know, perhaps through your great-grandfather during that time. Well, I would say this. You know, I think we are feeling a lot of things very acutely these days in, in the United States and where things become much more revealed, much more sort of at the forefront, but it doesn't really change the root of, of what, it, what it is, what you say societal sin is. And even the, the, you know, sort of the caliber of it and the, you know, if you zoom out a bit and you look a back in history and B just around outside of the U S you will see, just a just terrible suffering right. uh, ha- happening right now in different parts of the world. I had the, you know, I happen to be gifted with a perspective, right? And I'm really grateful for that, actually, even though it came with some suffering, because I was able to be sort of a Forrest Gump type personality. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, like who, who, can witness who who can live through a military coup and mass arrests and being in a refugee camp at age five in Chile, and then go to Africa and see and be in the middle of a civil war and then go to Russia, and be both sort of experience the 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 evils and the um, just the suffering of the Soviet system, which uh, by the you know was was eventually destroyed, only to be replaced by another type of tyranny and witness the Soviet Union, the unrest, the, the social unrest, the crises, multiple economic crises and meltdowns. So all, all, of, the, all of that in one lifetime, it's pretty remarkable. Um, and, and, you know, the reason I tell you this is that I have, I, although I, I am as upset as anybody else seeing some of the stuff that we've seen, we've seen on television lately, I think I have the gift of perspective where I don't really feel this is worse or different than we have done some than the things we have seen all over the world for millennia, you know, so it doesn't make it better, <laughs> you know, but it gives you perspective about 
about sin, as you said. You know, this is human name. This is the the fallen. This is the life of a fallen humanity. That's what it is. Yeah, no, definitely. I think uh, one of the things I think you'd mentioned a little while back was one of the things that a society, specifically the dominant society, when they want to perhaps oppress or do something of that effect, they do things like um, they'll use they'll use different terminology to try to change a certain people to make it worse than uh, they perhaps, you know, appear. They'll change the, you know, different settings and so forth. Can you maybe share about that a little bit as far as some of the things that you saw uh, during your time in, in, in Russia, or at least what you have heard about during your grandfather? Oh, if you, you mentioned just a little bit earlier about my great grandfather, is, are you, yeah, are you, yeah. Re, are you uh, yeah, so I think you were referring to that perhaps, but um, in, so this was, the Bolsheviks took over. Um, this was before I was born, obviously, great, great grandfather. And he was, um, he was a middle-class guy who lived in a village, you know, middle-class a hundred years ago. That's very different from middle-class now, and especially in America. So his house was a bit bigger than some other people. He, and because he had an entrepreneurial mind on a very small scale, the, men, the, the ideology of the communists was to literally eliminate not downplay, but physically destroy any class of people who was entrepreneurial. Right. So he was, they took all of his possessions and they shipped him to Siberia. And he was among the lucky ones because he was not killed. So fast forward a few years. Of course, if you're an entrepreneur, you will be an entrepreneur anywhere. Mm -hmm. He's in Siberia in the middle of nowhere and World War II hits. And my whole extended family, this is obviously before I was born as well, gets evacuated with uh, one of the last trains out of Moscow in that whole area. As a matter of fact, it's one of the last trains that was able to evacuate people because mm -hmm. the train was, was being bombed by Nazi bombers you know, for the first, whatever, you know, X, X, X amount of days that they were in the general area. So my grandmother had my, my mom and her two sisters, three babies, three small girls on a flatbed. It's not even a car. It's a flatbed on wheels in connected to a train and the train, the bombers would come and the train would stop and everybody would just run and the bombs would rain down. They would you know, get rid of the bodies, did some, did something with the bodies, pile on the train and keep going. That was the, their experience. So they eventually ended up rejoining, joining my grandfather, who was great grandfather, who was in, in, in Siberia. And he fed the whole family for the duration for the remainder of World War II, because there was no other source of food. And he by then had already, again, a cow, some sheep, you know, whatever it is, the combination of things he had as, as a entrepreneurial person. And um, it's just remarkable. It's a remarkable story from the standpoint of society can 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 put down and strip and and apply incredible power and injustice towards somebody. But if someone is that type of person, they will find a way, you know, mm -hmm. to both survive and also be generous and giving to other people. Yeah, I think as I was learning a little bit more about your story, it seems like you have inherited that spirit of just surviving but still having a heart to give, you know, pure with yes. the folk worldwide, a benevolent arm and so forth. I want to switch gears a little bit. So I know just as I've been learning about your passion for the ministry, I'm just very encouraged. And I know you started the uh, Austin uh, the tribe. downtown ministry, yeah, mm -hmm. tribe. Can you share about how that came about? I know at the time when it started, I think six years ago or so, you were, mm -hmm. co you know, bivocational. So you were like starting a company plus getting the ministry going. So can you share? About yes, I basically, I've been bivocational, meaning I would work in a ministry and do something else on the side for actually more, uh, the majority of the years that I've been in ministry. And I've been in ministry for 25 years, approximately. Um, and um, part of the reason is just, I don't know what it is. It's, uh, I get bored easily, perhaps. Um, like I actually felt guilty about it for the longest time because it wasn't, it was not really a normal thing to do and to be. So I've, um, 
for the longest time I felt, you know, gu guilty and maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I'm not devoted enough, all of those things. And eventually sort of with maturity comes a, re a realization that maybe you're wired a certain way and maybe there's a place for bivocational leaders in Christian ministry. So in, six years ago, I was in Los Angeles and I was also bivocational. By the time I had uh, started a, a entertainment company that has done fairly well, you know, could provide for our family and, and, and with relatively low effort. Um, and so, so that allowed me to serve. And so I did a lot of mission work and, you know, even self-funded mission work. And I really put, God put it on my heart to start a church, right? Um, both Deb and I had sort of gone through a time of, you know, recalibrating what we believe, what we want to do with life. It's like midlife crisis. I don't think she had that, that much of a midlife crisis, but I did for sure, you know, where I questioned everything, you know. So I had to, I was really wanted, wanting to relearn what it means to be a Christian, to be a leader, the purpose of life, what do you want to do for the next 20 years, that sort of thing. So I emerged out of that period of anxiety and sort of, you know, seeking something with a very, with a, a heart full of faith and desire to start something that, and, and the idea was to start a community that is um, very connected, very authentic, um, also very specifically designed around a certain type of culture, being in the city and being culturally relevant and sort of culturally sensitive to where we are and um, just being part of the community, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a, I guess in a, in a few steps bef ahead of what I've had experienced so far. So I wanted to make it maybe even closer to, to what I saw in, in the book of Acts. Um, so, so I had that idea and it sort of coincided that we had a, a church leader in Austin, uh, a church leader couple, Dave and Angela Hooper, who we've known forever. So we had the relational connection already. They were also doing missions in Russia, which I was interested in. And they also wanted to start a, a, a church in downtown Austin because the Austin church had expanded, you know how the, it's called the donut effect. Yeah. It starts in the city, but then as people age, they want more land, more house, more everything They start having kids or they want to save money. So they, there's a donut. So it was called the Austin church, but most people lived in the suburbs outside of Austin. So they wanted to really start the, uh, the, the downtown again. And so it, it all sort of the stars aligned and we came and we really, they didn't have the budget to support us in any significant way. It was just more of a supplementary thing. And we, but because we had a business with, we felt we, we wanted to do it. So we did it. And as we were planting the church, the niche business that we were serving at the time actually uh, um, d didn't work out. Basically, the market, the, the, the demand went down tragically. So we lost our business as we were starting a new church. So we had to start a new business and start a new church all at the same time. So that was the, mm. um, a, a bit of a prolonged sort of backstory to, to what happened. And that's what we started a business called Third Drive, which was essentially a marketing business uh, you know, it was me and the camera and a website and, you know, obviously I have, you know, experience. So I had, I had a portfolio to, to, to show that I can do some things. Uh, but it was really not much, much more than that. It was just really more of a glorified freelancer. Um, and then it expanded into graphic design, web design, branding, strategy, um, business development. So it, it expanded from that. And, uh, now we have several people who work for us and with us, and we have a business partner uh, here in Austin who's a, a, a Christian as well. And um, uh, and this and this we were developing that at the same time as we were starting a new church. So wow. that's that's un, that's unusual. <laughs> I think I your think. great grandpa would be very proud of you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You got your little cow. You know, you're you're definitely yep. doing what. You're doing. That's all. Awesome. That's awesome. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So. Um, I know that uh, you're also part of an organization called Renew, and I think mm -hmm. it's um, some partner organizations to it includes obviously Third Drive Faith, which we can talk about in a minute, uh, Harding School of Theology, Douglas Jacobi, uh, Jacobi's Teaching Ministry, as well as Guy Hammond. Can you share a little bit about the organization and also um, some of the inspirational figures such as Shadonki Johnston, Johnston, I believe, from Sierra Leone? Yes. So, so Renew was started by a guy named Bobby Harrington. And Bobby Harrington and I met at a, at a conference. We were both speakers. And he, you know, we sort of liked each other and connected afterwards. And he 
called me up and said, hey, I'm starting a new network called Renew. And the idea, well, actually there was no name at the time, but it was a new network. And, um, and the idea was to, he already started a, a conference, a yearly conference called discipleship.org that was basically focused on churches of all kinds, theologically and whatever, you know, and institutionally that were interested in the, uh, the practice of discipleship. Okay. And he wanted to start something on top of that, that was really more about grouping people who are theologically more aligned. So, and it became, so to be part of that group, you, you have to sort of agree with some of the core doctrines, right? That, um, and so mostly detracted leaders from the three streams of what used to be the restoration movement. Um, so I was invited as one of the, I believe, seven, I think, founding members of that. Okay. And those are the people who sort of got on calls and we went uh, to Nashville and spent some time together hashing out sort of the, the sort of the philosophy, the philosophy of it, the doctrinal core, things like that, you know. Um, so that's, that's what became Renew later. It was named Renew. And now it's, there's an there's a, a informational platform called Renew.org. And then there's a yearly conference. Now I think it might be two yearly conferences that's gonna, that are going to happen. Um, and the cool thing about that, being able to contribute to, to that work, is that I got to connect with people that are not from my same tribe. Now, I had already made it a, a point to go to a non-ICOC conference almost every year, especially when I was in Los Angeles. Okay. And the reason for that is because I wanted to var a variety of perspectives and I wanted to learn from other people. Mm -hmm. Even though that we might not agree fully doctrinally, I still wanted to learn and I admired some, uh, and I, I was able to connect some great people there. But, but I would go to an ICOC conference and I would be very connected relationally and I would go to a non-ICOC conference and I wouldn't know anyone, I would just li listen and learn. Mm -hmm. And this is probably the first experience that I've had where I would go to a non-ICOC uh, gathering and I would have friends, deep friendships there. Mm, great. With, with leaders of, of other churches that don't belong to, our, to the ICOC uh, group, family of churches. So uh, that has been really fantastic because you know, we, and most, most of those guys theologically are almost on the same page, like with very small nuances. But they had already learned, they, they come from such a different ecosystem that there's a lot to learn from each other. Mm -hmm. So Shadanki Johnson, the one you mentioned, uh, it was, it was, he's, a, he's a brother. He, 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 he's this incredible, incredible leader in Sierra Leone who is devoted to prayer and fasting and discipleship. And it's, he's all about disciples making disciples making disciples. Mm -hmm. And the scale of the movement that he leads there, it is, um, uh, it's absolutely inspiring and, and nothing we, we can even compare it to in the United States, actually, just the sheer numbers and the sheer, I guess, obstacles that they face because they, they operate in, uh, in, in a lot of places where the, the Muslim faith is a dominant faith, the Muslim culture as well. So, um, and sometimes it, it means danger, like physical danger to, to their lives and, um, the, the, the stories that he shares and um, just the sheer power of faith that he exudes when you speak to him, uh, it's, it's really remarkable, really remarkable. I think you'd mentioned that he has like 11,000 prayer warriors or something. Yeah, he has this network of, of prayer warriors specifically, like a, a prayer network. I've never heard of anything on that scale, you know, and, and yeah. I don't remember if the number is 11,000, but it's something in that general vicinity of tens, you know, more than 10,000 people. And um, it's, it's a mystery how he operates to me, but, but it is true. And if we've had people who we know well, who have gone and, and, and visited his work, I haven't per in person done that. And they come back just in awe really mm -hmm. of, of what's happening. So, so it's really, and, and the focus I think on, prayer and fasting is quite remarkable culturally because I think we, although we pray and fast, of course, um, I think it, it might not be a priority, um, a cultural priority, I guess, for us. I think we're, in, especially in the North American churches, we're much more, you know, intellectually motivated than prayer and fasting motivated. 
Um, and, and obviously, I, I'm careful with making sweeping statements because obviously it doesn't apply to everybody. But I, I would say as a trend, right? Mm -hmm. so, so just real quick, do, is it mostly for conference to get together as a conference? Is that what you guys do with Renew? That's the focus right now in, in your capacity or is it how well, you interact, I guess? It's it's well it's 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 different depending on how how much people invest right, but I think the primary goal originally was it was it was very clear I think Bobby's reasoning when he was first sort of coming up with the idea is that he saw that especially in North America there is the faith and, and especially biblical life has been corroded by, by basically post-Christian thought mm -hmm. um, uh, in a very significant way. And as a matter of fact, churches are, to be able to, to, to culture is shifting so quickly that churches who focus on retaining members and all of that end up compromising biblical standards so that they can fit into culture in, in not the right way, you know? So, so I think Renew was a response to that because what, what we wanted to do is to find a network of, of, of leaders, teachers, writers, uh, scholars who, will, who would be able to communicate with each other and sort of shoulder to shoulder, communicate sound doctrine, doctrine sound life and discipleship uh, concepts to the world and sort of to counteract some of the, the post-Christian progressive um, it's called progressive Christianity, uh, which is really not Christianity, um, yeah. has become a really invading the informational space and, um, and really, you know, damaging the, 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 the broader church in the United States. Okay, good deal. So uh, last two questions here is, uh, from what I know about you and what I've been learning about you, you're someone who's very curious, very curious person. Um, yes. And I think with that, you definitely love to learn new things. What are some uh, books and or podcasts that really inspire you? I believe oh. is actually from the name of a book, uh, I think Daniel Pink or so. What are some other books and podcasts that inspire you? I can, I, uh, I'm afraid I will have to send you a link. Okay. Uh, because the, the book, let me just pull it up. The, I have actually a book. Um, a book list <laughs> uh, and the, for that for that very purpose because people ask me what are you reading and there's so much material that um, um, but let me uh, uh, let me see if I can pull it up quickly if I can't I'll just send you the, the link no um, so okay books um, books um, but it's I have I, I guess I have a list um, I can't find it. <laughs> what are oh, some of the main ones? Top books. I found it. Okay. Okay. So I have categories. I have personal growth and spiritual books. And yeah. I have probably 30 titles here on the list. Then I have biographies and, his, biographies and historical books, which I like because of sort of real life um, things. And yeah. I have business books. I read a lot of business books. And I, the reason I read business books because, is because business books are, in essence, about ministry. Um, because business is about ministry. It's about serving. Um, so in let's let me, maybe, maybe I can give you a few examples on yeah. in the, in the personal growth and spiritual um, category. I have 12 rules of life, Jordan Peterson, uh, the war of art, which is not a spiritual book at all, but it's by Stephen Pressfield. And it's the best book I've ever read about being a professional. Mm -hmm. From spiritual books, uh, Sabbath, I have four or five titles about the Sabbath. I'm a practitioner of the Sabbath, a big believer. Um, so uh, books by Dan Allender, Wayne Mueller, Abram Heschel is sort of the, the, the authority. He's a, he's a rabbi. Mm -hmm. um, Walter Brugman. So these are, these are four. Seeing is Believing by Greg Boyd is a fantastic uh, book that was very, very instrumental for me when I was going through my midlife crisis because he sort of, he reinterprets faith through experience and, and, and sort of connects those two things. So it's just more than just um, the intellectual stuff. Um, there's a great series of books by Gila Mandelson, who talks a lot about purity, dating, um, at, and the, its roots in, in Jewish culture. 
and there's incredibly enlightening. Um, every, anything by Gregory Boyd is great. There's a great couple of books that are both spiritual and business oriented by Daniel Lappin, who's a rabbi. So Thou Shalt Prosper and Business uh, Secrets from the Bible. Um, so those are just personal growth and spiritual books. There's more, there's like 30 plus. I, I can send you a link. Um, biographies, uh, Bonhoeffer is a fantastic yeah. biography. Um, um, Leonardo da Vinci, Protestants, the history of Protestant, Protestantism was great. Born a Crime by Trevor Noah is great. Elon Musk's um, biography is fascinating. A great business biography is Shoe Dog by uh, Phil Knight, the guy who started Nike. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's, there's a bunch more, you know, biographies. Uh, on business, uh, uh, anything by Seth Godin, Daniel Pink, um, Lynchpin, Purple Cow, um, Simon Sinek, Start With The Why, uh, Zero To One. Um, um, and then uh, my, one of my favorites, latest one in business is the, uh, it's called um, The Messy Middle by Scott Belsky, who is VP of Adobe Product Development, I believe. And he started this, he's a, he's a creative. So he wrote a book about the hard, how to deal with the hard parts of starting a business. You know, the, it's called The Messy Middle. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, so anyway, I can go on and on because the list is long, but I don't want to, you know, take too much of your time. But I can send you a link. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. What I'll do is I'll put it in the show notes so people can kind of check those books out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any uh, podcasts real quick that stand out to you that are really inspiring? Uh, Tim Ferriss is probably the one I love. Uh, it's like the two uh, sort of the two parallels. Tim Ferriss is really good at dissecting best practices. Like that's his gift and his talent. He's fantastic. Like he lives here in Austin, by the way. Um, and then um, Daniel Lappin, the Daniel Lappin show is very, very fascinating because it offers such a completely different perspective on biblical it from Jewish wisdom. It's, it's basically um, a, a podcast by a rabbi. Uh, and uh, he's very flamboyant, very over the top. But if you listen uh, closely enough, there's some, there's some good stuff there. <laughs> um, I, 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 I follow a few of them. I, I go in waves. I, I, I sometimes go podcast or sometimes I just move on to audiobooks. And then I go, go back to podcasts again and, you know, back and forth and back and forth. Yeah. Um, um, there, 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 there are a few. Malcolm Gladwell has incredible podcasts. Uh, Revisionist History is brilliant. Yeah. And he has one on music. And, of course, being a musician, it's, it's, it's fantastic. And I can't remember its name. Uh, but it's, it's basically he goes, he talks to top producers and musicians and he dives into the inner workings of create, the music creation, music history, things like that. Yeah, he's so it's a like fascinating guy. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like imagine if you like if you look at revisionist history, he can do the same thing in music, and there's just so much gold there. It's it's just wonderful. So I can go on and on. There's a few of them as well. Yeah. So I think you're, so you to me you remind uh, I I think a little bit of Tim Ferriss when I think about you in the sense of venture capital and entrepreneurial spirit and these kinds of things. Uh, but obviously with the humility and the faith, obviously is the primary drivers, but that's all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I started, I started off as an entrepreneur cause I started my own music career as, as a startup. Right. So I was 25, 24 years old when I started and it was successful. So it's, it's one of those things that when you start something from nothing at such a young age and it actually has an impact it stays with you as a possibility, right? Right. Uh, so I think it sort of, I got the bug back then. And then eventually I, I sort of went away from it and, 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 and I, it came back, it sort of haunts you a little bit when it's already in your DNA. So I started reading books again and I got into business books and, and I started two companies since, two companies since then. Um, so, yes. So um, I know you started Third Drive Faith which I believe helps churches with their websites and just their communication and so forth. And yeah. I think definitely right now with uh, COVID-19 and people not being able to meet, um, I think those resources are vital. So can you share a little bit about how uh, Third Drive Faith can help churches and other organizations as far as what you guys can assist with? 
Yeah, so we start, we already were doing, was, we're doing, we were doing the same work for businesses, right? So we were doing the branding, messaging, video, web, print, all of the graphic design uh, for business. We had that capacity and it, it had strategy in it as well. And for the longest time, that's all we did. And then it, we, we also did it for the church here just because we happened to be in this church, right? So we, you know, so we created a couple of websites. One of them got an award and it, in the long run, it became very clear that our, our gro- some of our growth, growth and especially attendance, right? Attendance is people getting in the door had something to do correlated with the, with the way we approached communication and media in okay. general. So because we saw that as such, as such a successful magnet, you know, to get people in the door, um, it came to me that maybe I should start doing that for churches. But initially I was actually quite skeptical because I've never seen, um, especially in our family of churches, people invest in it. Like actually have a line item in the budget. So I was skeptical because I know what my price range was even for business. And it was so much, I mean, it was unfathomable to be that anyone can come in a church world would come near. So what we did is we we created this landing page and said, look, we, this is the stuff that we do. We can do it for you. We do, we can do it at a discounted rate, but it's still more than you're used to spending right Right, on on things like that. And then what we, what surprised me is that by the time we did it probably about a year and a half ago, so we could, you could tell that people are getting, are beginning to see the importance of it. So Mm -hmm. several churches, we were able to rebrand and relaunch several churches, help them with the whole range of communication assets. So this also includes not just the website, but if they have a series like something for the summer. Yes. So we, you can help put that all together yeah so we 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 create a artwork for every sermon series in austin christian and and it's multi multi-dimensional so we have printed invites we have banners on stage we have facebook cover web website uh, banners wow. um we the every single series is rolled out as an integrated communication tool you know and mm-hmm. then now we're doing animated even so there's an, ad, a, oh, wow. an animation of the introduction for the video. So, so we've done it for years and years and years. And we looked around and we realized that most of, especially in our family of churches, most of them don't do that. And we were like, well, maybe we're weird. Right. So, but it, yeah, the work that we do is a, to set it up, to set up a, a digital home essentially. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that integrates the graphic design, the logo, a new logo, a welcome video, things like that. And it's strategically put together. It's, it's, it's fantastic, powerful uh, tool. And then supporting churches on, on, on an ongoing basis because they need to communicate on an ongoing basis. It's the same thing as you build a home, you know, you don't just leave the home as it is, that you make it better, you remodel, you improve it, right? It's the same thing. Like, but I think many churches can thought of their web digital home as a static thing, which is it shouldn't be, right? Mm-hmm. You should have a concerted effort, ongoing effort to communicate with excellence and with an engagement level where people, especially outsiders, can pay attention. And insiders actually become very much more engaged because they're proud of their church family now. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. they you know so i would love to definitely keep talking we'll definitely have to uh, have you on the show again um you know as your time permits maybe in a, in a few months or so um because i know also the austin church is growing every year i think i, I think you had mentioned on, on that. yes for the last seven years we've grown every year yes yeah mm-hmm. um so yeah if you can maybe just share where we can find out a little bit more about you and for maybe for churches that want to learn more about third drive faith uh, yes, you can. So basically, if you want to look at the church or the ministry, go to austinchristian.org or atxtribe.org. Um, it will lead you to different parts of the website. If you want to go learn about Third Drive, you can go to thirddrive.co. This is sort of the business side of it. Or you can go to thirddrive.co slash churches, which is the stuff for the churches. Um, also, we actually started a nonprofit. So we serve kids in Africa, in Mozambique. And that, that URL is Ascend Mission Fund, ascendmission.fund. Um, and we've, you know, it's basically, we we're just make, making the first steps uh, now. Um, and it was designed to be an academy for kids with entrepreneurial, sort of an entrepreneurial dimension in languages and computer science, that sort of thing. 
but because of COVID, we switched over because kids can't get out of the house anyway. So now we're focusing on food and because there's the economic distress of COVID-19 in the poorest areas of, of the world is, is, is catastrophic. So, um, so we're basically feeding 300 people throughout the, for the duration of the, of the quarantine. And so we're basically sending them food, distributing them food, identifying with the, who the families are who are most vulnerable, and we're delivering the food to them. So that's what we're doing in Africa. And if you want to learn more about that, you can go to ascendmission.fund. Okay. And I'll try to put that in the show notes too. That's A-S-C-E-N-D? Like uh, correct. Ascend. Yes. Okay. Ascend, like going up. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, yeah. thanks so much for your time. Uh, I actually am so excited about uh, there are definitely are challenges with COVID-19, but I think one of the great things is it's opened up at least my eyes to let's communicate all over the world, you know? Yes, and absolutely. I think to be able to learn, you know, from people like you and just get that interaction, I think is amazing. So yes. thanks for your service for so, so many years. And uh, we definitely wish you the best and we'll, we look forward to having you on again sometime. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Thanks again.